the following documents and recordings are the continuing instalments in a compilation detailing the events surrounding the stranded archaeological team sent to base Camp Piedra and the rescue team sent in search of them. Previous records show the archaeological team remaining at the Patagonian site to consist of Dr. Josefa Guerrero and Simon Hall, with the now assumed losses of Dr. Carito Ureta, Dr. Xiao Liu, and Lucas Criado. The assembled rescue team consisted of Graham Kasner, Dragana Vukovic, Ramey Armstead, and returning archaeological team member Ava Olivia Moreno, having lost Mahir Asa to the dangers of the site. Following the previous instalment, Mr. Kasner stood over the body of Dr. Rosa Della Torre, while Ms. Vukovic kept watch on the distant door. In the winter months, Snowstorms and rainfall in the Patagonian ice fields can drastically affect the landscape. Worsened by heavy winds, such storms can reduce visibility and lead to glacial calving, ice collapses and avalanches. During these conditions, travel is not advised. The White Vault After a night's sleep in Stockholm, I awoke to a call from the front desk of the hotel, informing me that a car would be there to pick me up in an hour. I had spent some time the previous night looking up information on Valsingena Handelsbolag and my mother, the company's current president and CEO. The earliest documented instance of Valsingena Handelsbolag, then under a different name, was in the 1520s as a family operated trade and mining company managing a line of overground imports from the north and several small store yards. It was recorded in 1856, when asked about the formation of the company, that the daughter of the then president stated the family had been operating store yards and selling protective services for travelers and traders since as early as the 1200s. This claim cannot be confirmed by any documents. When she was asked what routes the family traders had commonly traveled back in the 1200s, she spoke of old relics her family still had from long past trips to Lapland. The family company had a building and land outside of what would become the village of Sertherfoss in Uppsala County, Sweden, until the 1540s, when they moved their family and business to their secondary location in the city of Uppsala. In 1702, the fire that damaged much of Uppsala also destroyed their storeyards, buildings, and place of residence but it was well documented that Walsingna had exported all of their trade stuff three nights before, and the yards were empty as they arranged the next shipment. The family was on a trip back to see family in Serdathos at the time of the fire. None of the family were harmed, and the business decided to sell off the lands, turning a small profit and moving the company to Stockholm within the year. In Stockholm, they reinvested in modern mining practices, and while based in Stockholm, the controlling family spent much of their time visiting the mining operations that Valsingena began to rely on. By 1840, Valsingena Handelsbolag had become a premier mining and import company, with growing influence outside of Sweden. My mother, the daughter of the previous president and CEO, gained control of the company in 1987, five years after I was born. In 1989, she then married a young Swedish librarian, and they soon had a daughter, my half-sister. In 1991, her husband died of complications of pneumonia, and as previously documented, her daughter died in a car accident earlier this year, 2010. After this research, I slept, and suffered the similar dreams I had previously expressed. By morning, when I was awoken by the phone call, I was prepared to continue this line of inquiry. When I met the car in the front of the hotel, I had brought with me my phone, passport, additional recorder, and a box containing the artifact. The driver of the car did not speak English, but was impeccably courteous and indicated to the two large envelopes waiting in the back seat. I recorded the car ride using my phone, but little to nothing was said. 
The two large envelopes contained a large quantity of photos, all dated in the bottom left-hand corner and sealed inside plastic sleeves for protection. The oldest photo was from 1979. It is a group photo of around 24 people, standing on a bridge with the Thames in the background. Everyone in the photo is a business professional or their spouse. On one side of the photo, I could identify my father's younger self and his then wife, and toward the center of the photo is my mother. The photo is labeled as a International Conference, June 1979. There are several additional photos of tourist-like outings across London with the large group. Another photo, just one, is from September of 1979. It is of my father smiling and standing outside a cafe in Stockholm's recognizable Gamla Stan. There are several photos from across 1980. The majority show both my father and mother posing near well-known attractions in several countries. Fields of tulips dated in April, Swedish landscapes in May, French castles and sites from Paris dated in June, washed out photos from Istanbul under the September sun. It is clear that by 1980, my mother and father had established a relationship. The envelope also contained a printout of the divorce filings, with highlighted sections showing his submitted date to initiate the process of divorce as of April 1980. I have known most of my life of my father's previous and unhappy marriage to his childhood sweetheart. During the divorce proceedings, it became evident that both parties involved had begun affairs within the months leading up to the proceedings. They were both successful in their own fields and the eventual separation was amicable. In January of 1981, the divorce between my father and his now ex-wife was settled. The second envelope contained more photos of my mother and father, this time all depicting them in Sweden during the year of 1981. These appeared more as a family photo album, though my mother's family were never present in the pictures. They looked to be out on hikes, out to dinner, and in one early photo, they are posing in an empty apartment with a few small boxes in the back corner of the room. One of the final photos was a printout of an ultrasound from November of 1981, seven months before my birth on June 5th, 1982. The point of these pictures, I now know, was to show me just how happy they had been together. No photos or documents were included regarding their eventual split. While examining the contents of the envelopes, I had lost track of the car's movements, but we soon stopped in front of a large glass building in a more business-oriented district of Stockholm. I was still recording as I stepped out of the car. This section is the final few moments of the longer recording from my mobile. Thank you. Hello, we've been expecting you. I hope your ride over was comfortable. My name is Ebba, and I work as the assistant to, well, your mother. Is there anything that I can get for you? Black tea would be nice. Thank you. I'll be happy to prepare you some once we get inside. Do you require assistance with your case? No, thank you. I can manage. Before we go in, it is company policy that the front desk holds your cell phone until you're ready to leave. No exception for me? Not that I know of, but she is full of surprises recently. After the death of Essie, that was our nickname for your sister. She grew up running around this building. Well, we were so surprised to learn she had another daughter. Now, your cell phone. I would not want you to miss the lunch meeting. Yes, fine. Here. Thank you. This concludes the third set of records regarding my own strain of inquiry into the events that took place at Svalbard and Cerro Torre. Returning now to the collected records from Cerro Torre, the following is a continuation of Mr. Catton's body camera recording after they found Dr. Guerrero and located the body of Dr. Rosa Della Torre. It begins about a minute after the last presented section from the camera.
Was she a friend of yours? From your team? I had never met her, but he had been on an expedition with her. How long can we spare? Are we waiting for something before we return? He will not take too long. He has a purpose, I'm sure. Graham? This is Rosa. You would have liked her. She's wearing the exact same clothes from when we tried to escape the bunker. The blood from the injuries and, and treating my leg. The tear just there. All the same. She didn't get out of Svalbard, fly to Patagonia and climb this mountain. She... she just... How did she get here? Where is Svalbard? In the Arctic. Off the north of Norway. Graham, I'm willing to accept that to be true. Because of all the other craziness going on. But are you sure? Svalbard is over 15,000 kilometers from here. The same. Weeks ago on the other side of the world. And this is her. If true, that is astonishing. A doctor, please stay nearer to us. These things are too fast to have a split up. Hmm. I'm just going to the wall. Here. Look. I can't look. It's for our own good that I am watching the door. And one set of eyes is weak enough to begin with. Then I'll explain. I have been in here for some time now. And I've been trying to determine something from these clips. I don't have access to my notes, but that doesn't mean I can make attempts at understanding. See, this one line, here, connects all the way back across the wall and up the ceiling to a central collection of circles, here. Well, all these other lines come from it as well, and they meander across the walls, possibly in a particular scheme I don't yet recognize, to these separate cliffs, each of fauna. This, here, is a condor, an Indian condor, most likely, and it's situated over this larger rectangular glyph, possibly representing a dais or stage. Perhaps a pedestal. That's here, then, Patagonia. But this then, if we follow it back to the center and down, we have another line that is a large bear, possibly a polar bear, possibly Svalbard. And following this line, we have a large boar-like creature with tusks. This boar, though I know this is highly speculative, could represent the site in northern China. So could that bird, or that large feline creature, or another? <sighs> really, there is so much we don't know, but perhaps there are more? While I appreciate your enthusiasm, I think we may want to save the speculation for later. And not to discount any theory you may have come up with while in here, but nothing helps explain how she got here. Yes, I apologize, of course. The things can look like us, correct? So perhaps it isn't her, but one of them? Let's give him a minute more. On your way in, did you happen to see an American man, about mid-twenties or so? Right her average height. Simon? He's alive. He's very ill and needs professional medical treatment. But he's alive. We found him in the cave entrance. He told us you were still in here. Oh, gracias a Dios. Estaba muy preocupada. Él mereció salir de todo esto. Thank you. I can express how impossible, no, improbable, it feels that you are here. It is a relief to feel hopeful, even if just for now. Don't thank us yet. We're not out of this, so we're not safe. Yes, but where there was no hope before, at least there is a glimmer now. Though, I am sorry for your friend. I barely saw his face before he was gone, but he came here for us, and I cannot forget that. I did not know him well enough to tell you more, but I know he was also here to collect information on this place. So in that way, I think... Graham, I don't mean to cut short any expression of your emotions knowing how rare they are, but we're not safe here. Do you have another gun? Will a gun work? I don't think it will. Not as a solution, but hopefully as a deterrent. I see. 
if we are going to be here a bit longer, do you have any paper, a notebook, um, maybe a pen? Sure. Go in my pack. Second zipper from the outside. There should be a notebook there. It is a lure. That is the exact same scream I hear made last time. No, I heard Carito. She was taken long ago now. Perhaps we are not so eager to go back into the dark. Due to the overlapping nature of the recording, it is important to maintain the chronological order of events as closely as possible. The following recording comes from the body camera of Mr. Armstead. Ava! Ava, can you hear me? What are you doing? Is Tessa here? Hey, Simon. No. Sorry, but we'll see her back in Pittsburgh. Y your parents, too. A whole lot of us just waiting for you to come home. I tried. I know. I never thought you wouldn't. Just rest. It's my turn to take over, so don't worry about it. Ava, get back here and sit down, please! There's too much on the line for you to walk off and chuck some rocks around. Ava! Coming back. <clears throat> what are you doing over there? One of the others had already moved several layers of boxes from the floor of the anatomical theater. I wanted to see how far they went. And I think I found the top of a passageway. Wait, the boxes with the hearts and teeth? You shouldn't mess with those. We honestly shouldn't even be in the same goddamn room as them. Well, for now, we are. So what was in the passageway? I should have taken it easier. I didn't get to go in. I only uncovered the top of an opening. It's a small space. I'd have to duck to fit. But it's under the lowermost stone rise and looks like it goes straight for a while. Deep enough that my light didn't reach the end. Wait, straight down or straight flat? Flat. It heads north, under the rising platforms. It also had these small statuary niches along the walls. I couldn't reach in far enough to grab one to inspect, but they didn't look like stone at all. They looked like bug shells. Husks, or whatever. Uh, everything is bugs with you. Uh, hand me that notebook. I want to draw it before I forget. Sure, just use the back pages. You drew these? These are good. Not archaeologically accurate, but good. Yeah, well, what else am I supposed to do when you're just waiting for them to get back? We don't even know if they'll come back. Yeah, I've been thinking that too. We don't hear from them within the hour. We'll figure something else out. These look good. You captured some of the glyphs Simon never got to scan before shit hit the fan. They're the ones I can see from here. Like that walrus seal whale above your head. Draw your bug before you forget it. Well, the one I could see had large wings folded in like a beetle. That's just a beetle. That's actual size. That's a terrifying beetle. I just can't believe the sheer number of boxes. The floor is maybe six by six feet. The rectangular dais is maybe two by three. I had to go down about six layers of boxes to see the top of the passageway, which was about another four feet from the ground, so maybe five feet total, or minimum, I guess. So, six, six, five. One hundred and eighty square feet. How large is a box? Oh, maybe four or five inches on each side. Give me a second. Does the dais go all the way down, or do you think it stops? Let's assume it goes all the way down. That's an estimated minimum number of boxes. Oh. Uh. Simon? Can you help me redress his leg? I have some worries. Of course. What worries? His fever is rising. 
Even with the antibiotics, but I don't know if we should expect any improvement this soon or not. Can you get out the acetaminophen pills? And hand me some fresh gauze, please. What's that mean? Ugh. Well, the pus is draining, so I think that's a good thing. Maybe not all of it, though. I'm worried he may be septic or get septic soon. If he is, what do we do? I'm doing all I can think of, but I'm not a doctor. Sepsis would mean bacteria in the bloodstream. Pass me the tape. Thanks. So, the antibiotics in the IV are, are really what we're betting on. We can control fever with the pills, but if he gets too warm, we may need to cool him down. When? Is there some way to know? Do, do we bring him out in the snow? Not yet. And I don't think leaving him out there is a safe idea. Not with that thing out there. But we could always bring something cold to him. Snow, ice, cold rocks. My abuela used to stick ice under our armpits when we had a fever. Don't know if it's medically sound, but it seemed to work on me. If you tell me when, I'll do it. There are some small enough rocks just outside the entrance. Not yet. Let's let the medicine work for now. What he really needs is a doctor. Which is why we need to start back down this mountain. We will. Soon. We can start repacking. <clears throat> You're hiding being worse off than before, and I honestly can't think of a less intelligent thing to do when you're stuck up on a mountain than try to hide the reality of the situation. Saying you're right doesn't fix the situation. <sighs> Let me see your bad arm. If you can't stomach Simon's ankle, you don't want to see my arm. And I just rebandaged it earlier. Taking it off now would just agitate it more. When we first got here, we thought this place was going to make our careers. Simon had all this amazing equipment and so much enthusiasm. He's an outwardly expressive guy. You could see the amount of pure joy he had at the prospect. I felt the same way, though granted I always had to be a bit reserved around Dr. Oretta. Dr. Oretta was your professor? Yeah. We didn't get along, but she was such an intelligent woman. I wanted to work with her for years before I met her. I chose to apply at La Plata to work with her. It was rough, but I think it was all working out. When I saw this fieldwork opportunity, I took the chance. The excitement felt solid. After getting here, I had to contain my excitement. But this place was beautiful. It still is. You drew it because you could feel it too, I bet. This tiny pull that tells you that this is something momentous, crucial. Even when it was just glyphs on the mountainside, then it became the cave, chambers, the amount of work skyrocketed, but so did the sheer joy. <laughs> I can imagine his face. He gets big-eyed and smiles at the side of his face. That's the one. A disarming mix of determination and wonder. In the end, maybe it was hubris to think we could take credit for revealing this all to the world. We should have seen the signs as soon as we saw the cave. No, even before that. When Dr. Oretta came up to survey the original glyphs, she should have felt it then. I think about it constantly now. The why. Why has this been hidden for so long? Others would have told the world if they could have. But Raimi, when we saw it for the first time... Here, drink some water. Don't think about it. Try to put it from your mind for now. We still have some time to wait. Just try to relax, maybe. The notebook of Mr. Armstead contains the picture of the large, beetle-like husk drawn by Miss Moreno, as well as Mr. Armstead's drawings of several of the large animal glyphs. His drawings are not scaled for accuracy, but he drew several faunal glyphs that were not otherwise documented outside of Mr. Acer's brief video pass. Mr. Armstead drew one glyph which appears to be a large creature most closely resembling a megatherium or great ground sloth. Others depicted possibly more contemporary animals, such as additional species of birds and one depiction of some species of large reptile. The elongated snout and ridged tail indicating a possible alligator or crocodile. 
the minimal geometric style of the original glyphs and their interpretation through Mr. Armstead led to a few identifying features through which to better interpret the drawings. Additionally, there is a page where Mr. Armstead took notes on the maths he used to calculate the amount of boxes on the floor of the anatomical theatre. After calculating the volume of the floor and deducting the volume of the dais, he then divided it by the volume of a single box, coming to a conclusion of an estimated minimum of 4,050 stone boxes. The following is a continuation of the recording from Mr. Kasner's body camera. You have been here some time. What is the hum? I don't know. I have thought it may be some kind of resonance, but it would still need some... I don't remember the word... thing to make it happen. Do you have more water? Yes. Take the bottle from the side of my pack. You're welcome to it. We have more food as well, but it's good to pace yourself. about the door? What door? Behind us. I need to keep an eye on the entrance. But behind us, next to the woman's body, is is that a door or is it just a carving? Was that what you indicated to when you were talking about the condor pedestal or something? I wasn't looking at you. Directly below the large condor glyph. I see what you mean. A ceremonial door could be a possibility. I don't see a crease or a way to open it, but it does have signs of dragging on the stone in front of it. Some of these scratches on the floor go right up to the wall, perhaps from the movement of a heavy object. Well, if you want to say any final goodbyes to this place, start now. Graham, we need to get going. You need to say your goodbye as well. I can't think. Of what I should do. Do we do we leave her here? The body? What's wrong with her hand? Graham, look at that. On the left hand? What is that? It appears to be crumbling. I have never seen such a thing. Does this happen with cold weather? No, it doesn't. <sighs> is that a jowl? She just left. There, what's that? Teeth. The body camera footage continued to be slightly blurry since the team entered the innermost chamber, but the strange event that unfolded here was caught on video. Mr. Kasner reached for the hand of Dr. Delatore's body. Her hand had clearly suffered some kind of damage as the distal joints of her last three fingers had appeared to have depressed flat. As Mr. Kasner reached for her arm to raise it for inspection, he made contact with her clothing. Her clothing and body caved in at the point of contact, and the collapse reaction continued to spread across the body as the form of Dr. Delatore quickly became an array of slowly collapsing coloured dust. The whole event took place in under 10 seconds. What remained after the complete collapse of the corpse was a pile of multicoloured particles and the slight white glimmer of her teeth, which had fallen to the stone floor beneath where her head had rested. This concludes the sixth set of documents and recordings from the rescue team at the site on Cerro Torre and completes this section of information regarding the rescue operation at Base Camp Piedra. The White Vault 